Hello, everyone. Welcome. Happy Thursday. It's it's very hot here in New York. I hope you're staying cool if you're in New York as well. Um, really good to see you back on the NSC. And hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 893rd New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail. And today I have the huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation featuring Zev Greenfield, Bint, David Farrow of Evil Dentist, and William Corwin. And we're thrilled to welcome Theodore Ted Kerr here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. And here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host, Bint is an interdisciplinary artist and musician based in Brooklyn. Working across visual performance and sound art, Bint applies contemporary methods to the traditional multicultural technologies of her ancestries. Evil Dentist was created by David Farrow and Alice Gerlach as a response to the decline in do-it-yourself venues, which was accelerated by the pandemic. Evil Dentist seeks to reclaim space for unconventional artist-run venues prioritizing community over commerce. And Evil Dentist is also the 2023 Suzanne Fiol Curatorial Fellow at Issue Project Room. David Farrow of Evil Dentist is a sound artist, researcher, and ethnomusicologist who employs noise, synthesis, and field recordings to explore how sound and listening practices construct political space. Zev Greenfield has been the chief curator and director of Issue Project Room since 2015, where he oversees the organization's programs, staff, and operations. Prior to this current position, Greenfield was managing director of the Bird Hoffman Watermill Foundation and the vice president of finance and administration for the Orchestra of St. Luke's. And our host today is sculptor and journalist William Corwin, who's from New York. He has exhibited at galleries in New York, London, Hamburg, Beijing, and Taipei. He's a regular contributor to the Brooklyn Rail, among other publications, and he's also the editor of Formalism, Collected Essays of Saul Ostro, published in 2020. Um, thank you all so much for being here today to talk about 20 years of Issue Project Room, and with that, I'm thrilled to pass it over to you, Will. Um, it's very exciting to be able to talk to Zev and everyone from Issue Project Room about the 20th anniversary. Um, personally, I, being a lifelong New Yorker, I've always been really fascinated by uh, the history of grassroots organ uh, art organizations. Um, you know, Judson uh, Church, uh, Theater for the New City, um, many, many places, uh, the clock tower. And so being able to talk to, you know, the the founders and not just not the founders, but the maintainers of these traditions is really, really important for us to understand, first of all, how these things come into being. And then second of all, how we maintain them, since they are almost always existing on a very tenuous, uh, tenuous thread, uh, you know, the Brooklyn Rail, uh, the, you know, many of us are just trying to hang in there uh, in the face of sort of a lack of any kind of funding. So I guess my first question to Zev is, uh, first of all, can we talk about the legacy of Suzanne Fial and the origin story of Issue Project Room? Well, thank you for having us. Um, it's wonderful to be here and speaking on behalf of everybody in the Issue Project Room family. We're really honored to be asked to participate and particularly at such a momentous moment for us as we're entering our 20th anniversary. It's, it's really special and I'm pleased to be sharing the platform with um, some fantastic artists that we're supporting and, and elevating their practice. So most importantly, thank you for joining us uh, today on Zoom, but we'd love to see you at some upcoming events, particularly the artists that are, are presenting um, today um, and those that are participating during our 20th anniversary. Um, we were founded in no November 2003, um, and Suzanne started Issue Project Room because 
she was finding that there was a lack of spaces for musicians and artist friends to actually present their work. So it's really interesting that the New York City and the general cultural environment goes through these cycles and circles, but we always seem to be perennially out of space or out of uh, room to actually be um, presenting work and, and engaging with community. Um, so Issue is founded on a really important principle that exists that we're looking to bring artists and audiences together in, in an artistic dialogue. And it's aiming to do so in a way that is supporting artists and practitioners that otherwise would not have access to space and resources. Um, we've gone through various cycles um, throughout the past 20 years, but I'm um, just referencing Suzanne. Um, she tragically passed away in 2009. And so issue has gone through particular instances where um, Suzanne would lead us, but then having um, her pass changed the dynamic of what issue project room was doing and where we were doing it. Um, but we stand on uh, on the shoulders of, of all the work that she did. And we really feel an obligation to maintain and grow and elevate um, what she put into place and we hope that we continue that legacy um, now and, and into the future. Um, yeah. And then there were there is a history of, of different spaces that, that Project Room inhabited. There was a garage on the east side, then there was a silo. Um, how were these spaces found and, and, and how did they end up, you know, injecting their, their personality into the program that, that Issue Project Room would, would put forward? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to to uh, assume that they were all found by brilliant strategy, but I think that the New York City real estate market often dictates what you do and where you do it. Um, rather than focusing just on where we went each time following the silo, we were at the American Can Factory, I think the really important um, moment in time came about when uh, the Bloomberg administration chose to sell the 110 Livingston building to a developer and the 22 Borum space became open for a nonprofit um, who could, through uh, putting through a request for proposal, ask to access that space. And Suzanne, to her credit, convinced the Issue Project Room board that this was the future of the organization. And we were lucky enough to be selected. And in 2008, we signed a 20 year lease on that space and issue started doing programs there a few years later. Um, just a short time ago during the pandemic, we managed to convince the landlord to donate the theater to us. So we're proud owners of the space now, and that will ensure the long-term legacy and sustainability of not only the organization, but having a home and a hub for experimental practice in the future. Um, and then just quickly, um, William, because of, the, the question that you asked, I think what's really interesting and important, and ultimately I'll defer to my artistic colleagues who will speak shortly. Um, I think that the nature of space can dictate the curation, but also the curation can help dictate the nature of space. So I think the work that Evil Dentist is doing in particular is really fascinating in the way that space is questioned to be activated. But we're very, very conscious and conscientious when we're thinking about what programs to place in different environments and in particular, which partner organizations we're working with, particularly if they've got venues. And we're very grateful for the partner organizations that continue to support us um, both over the past few years while we've had a lack of access to our space because of renovation, but also just ongoing partnerships and support networks that exist in our community. Now we have two two artistic artists, two artists uh, with us to talk about their projects. But I wanted to ask you before we we talk to them, what is happening this weekend? Because you you said there's some there's an event that's a collaboration with the Brooklyn Music School. So yes, so so we we start our twentieth anniversary this Saturday night. Uh, we have Roscoe Mitchell and John McCown. John was a twenty twenty artist in resident. So the idea of having a legendary pioneering artist working with a recent artist in resident. Uh, and collaborating is quite monumental. And we also have a group called Beam Splitter, which features Audrey Chen, who was an artist in resident more than a decade ago. So we're referencing these histories, but we're, we're bringing them forward in collaboration. 
that's taking place at First Unitarian, um, and we very much hope everybody can join. On Sunday at three o'clock at Brooklyn Music School, we then have a free improvisational workshop with Roscoe and John. So anybody's more than welcome to join that as well. And then we launch into our 20th anniversary. We have a whole range of events, both off-site and then at 22 Borum. A lot of the events are free. I'm seeing a few names of other artists uh, in the Zoom um, that are participating. Um, and so rather than calling out any one individual, just go to our website and RSVP. A lot of the events are free, very heavy discounts for members. And that's my only little pitch I'm going to do on, on Zoom today. So on September 15th, your current artist uh, fellow, uh, artist resident, the 20th anniversary 2023 artist resident, Bint, is um, is doing their continuing project, Salve e Coagula. And this is called Stage 2, The Whitening. I wanted to start by, if you could, I'm, you know, I'm always interested in what the artist is doing. Uh, what is this project and, and how long have you been working on it? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, coming up on the 15th, it's the second installment of my residency program um, through Issue Project Room called The Whitening. It's the second stage of three. Um, so over the course of my residency year, I've been presenting three programs mirroring the three alchemical stages of transmutation um, with a focus on transmuting shame. That's, that's the gist of it. And I've chosen to present each of these three programs uh, split into the blackening, the whitening, and next will be the reddening as uh, communal ritual workings loosely based on the Sufi Sema gatherings and um, the intention of these gatherings and moving through this alchemical process. Uh, the intention was to transmute anonymous stories of communal shame that I had been collecting at the beginning of the year from folks of the Middle Eastern, North African, and South Asian diaspora. So there's like a lot of, it's, it's a bit of a complex, many layered um, project that I've taken on. And are these stories from, how, how do you go about collecting them? Do you, do you speak to friends or do you, you know, put out a request for people to sort of come up with testimonials for you? How does that work? Yeah, well, it was only at the beginning of the year. So um, the whole time from like January 1st, when I announced that I was an artist in resident with um, Issue Project from this year until the first show, which was in March, um, I put out a call online on Instagram and people were sharing it um, through different newsletters, um, just asking for anonymous responses. And I forget the website, but there are some anonymous site where you could like anonymously review your boss or workplace and things like that. And I kind of set that up to receive these stories and um, had people sending them in from different places, it seems like, because afterwards, a few people, they didn't keep it anonymous and they reached out to me on Instagram to kind of share a little bit about their experience. So um, I do know that there are people from many different places who participated. Mm. Is there, do we have any visuals we can share for Bint? Silver, could we, could we take a moment and look at some of the work? Can everyone see the screen? Great.
Now you've been, you've talked about um, how you kind of utilize this intersection of sound and alchemy. And you've used the work, work you, you, you cite the work of Halim el uh Steve Reich, um, Lamont Young, uh, and uh, Marion Zazila as influences. Um, I, I find it really fascinating this this idea of drone, the drone sound and alchemy. How long how long have you been working with this in your practice and, and how did you come to this kind of discover this intersection or utilize this intersection? Um, right. So uh, off the bat, I do want to say, so those references were in particular reference to the whitening stage mm -hmm. that I've been working on, specifically focusing on that um, the stage of the whitening has a very, um, it's very focused on minimalism, very clean cut, very bare bones, very stripped down, um, where the clip we just watched was from the blackening, um, it was very dark. Um, there's, that's the process of dissolution. There's a heaviness, there's weight, there's, it's related to lead and Saturn, like the metal lead, um, where whitening is the complete inverse opposite. And um, it's, it's a lightning, there's a suspension there. Um, so in that vein, I've been really uh, inspired by the artist that you just mentioned. And I've been working with that realm, which is very foreign to me, to be honest, um, since March, so since the ending of my last show. I'm um, getting ready for the next show on the 15th. Um, so, and then, and I do want to say it's not a connection with the drone and alchemy per se. Um, alchemically, I am using each of the themes and planetary and metallic associations with each of these stages that inform what drones I'm using, like what keys, what tones, what effects I'm using with the drones um, and what the feel, what feeling the drone should be evoking in the emotional state of the attendees. So I'm using it that way in my practice, but um, as a point of differentiation, repetition rather than drones is more is a more prominent tool and theme throughout the series, like all three of them, not just the whitening. And with that, there's a, this practice of dhikr. It's called in Arabic, which is the repetition of holy words, phrases, often divine attributes. Um, it's very similar to reciting the rosary or mantras, um, but there's a little bit of a twist to it um, culturally, but uh, that's a common practice and technology at the core of Sufi gatherings, particularly the Sema. So um, with this series, um, I'm using different musical tools and like technologies like synths and Ableton and uh, different software to emulate this experience for the space and ent attendees in a traditionally but respectful manner. Uh, for example, instead of having everyone chanting like foreign words that they have no connection with, that um, uh, that they don't know, and without like a sheikh or like an elder to be leading the space and ritual. Um, for example, in the whitening program, I'm using tape loops of samples and field recordings from actual ceremonies that I've been a part of, or um, from elders that I've had permission for to use, or um, Kind of like transporting the actual like authentic experience to the space and kind of keeping it traditional but um uh also like um you know adapting it to being in new york and having it kind of a secular and just kind of open experience for everyone who's there now switching gears let's talk to evil dentist which is um alice gerlock and david farrow we have david farrow here with us um, you are the Susan Fiol Curatorial Fellows for this uh, this season, 2023. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what, how did you go about choosing the different performers and uh, interventions and events for your curatorial fellowship? Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you to the Brooklyn Rail for having us. It's really nice to be in conversation with everyone. Um, Initially, our idea for this really came from thinking about how DIY or do-it-yourself and uh, artist-run spaces had developed in New York over time. And what we noted was uh, whenever there was a sense of financial or real estate crisis, uh, there were artists there to take advantage of it. Uh, and so we looked at uh, the examples of like the Lower East Side uh, after the financial crisis in the 1970s. Um, we looked at you know disinvestment um, due to racial disparity. 
uh, in Brooklyn throughout the 90s and 2000s and saw that artists were responding to the uh, availability of cheap space by creating collectives and by then collectively managing those spaces. Uh, so our intervention was to think, what are the crises defining our time? And for us, it kind of came down to how the pandemic has reshaped uh, the availability of space and particularly office space. Uh, we noted that as the result of working from home, uh, you have wide stretches of Midtown uh, that are just completely vacant. Uh, and you also have arts organizations or that are not using spaces in the same ways that they used to, to use them. Uh, and we wanted to create a series of programs that reflected on what could be done and what directions could we push um, this, this crisis in such that it could benefit artists and it could ben create more accessible space. Um, because if we look to like the property crises after say 9-11, where there was a bunch of available office space downtown or available apartment space downtown, there were some transformations towards affordable housing, but there was also a lot of upscaling to luxury condos. And there was a creation of, you know, increasingly higher, or higher really structured access to property. Uh, so when we wanted to design this program, we thought, how could we stage a series of programs um, that argued for uh, artist management of these available spaces? Uh, and so when we were thinking about the spaces we wanted to have the shows in, we wanted to find office spaces or underutilized spaces that uh, whether it be corporations or arts organizations or universities, um, we could take over for a moment and reimagine it almost in a like carnivalesque sense of what it could be if it were to be managed in a different way. Um, so that was the conceptual thrust behind our program, um, which we so far have uh, implemented by using a office space at NYU for our first program and actually issue project rooms, the office space for our second program as they were moving offices and had a underutilized space uh, that we we could take advantage of. Um, when we were then thinking about the artists that we wanted to highlight, we wanted to pick people who were invested in the do-it-yourself tradition, who are artists who, you know, maybe had had some degree of recognition, um, but who were really uh, playing spaces that were run by other artists, were engaging in practices of mutual aid, where they had to share resources, time, collaborative energy, um, and to really focus on community work as opposed to commercial work, which we see as like an important distinction within artistic practice. Um, and so for our first program, we had Kate Mahanti, who is a experimental saxophonist who, um, you know, could be playing and sometimes does play in these more like formal jazz settings, but is a very big player within uh, various DIY spaces for the past 10 years and has played dirty basements as much as like jazz venues. Um, and Frankie Consent, who is a Atlanta-based um, experimental choreographer, uh, electronic musician, uh, performance artist, um, who has can create these elaborate spectacles uh, using very little resources, and really highlighting that is that is a practice um, that that's that's indebted to the work of community building. Um, and then for our second program, uh, we wanted to continue that arc, uh, so we had a uh, local artist uh, Cal Fish who has been one of the um, overseers, kind of uh, main uh, operators of the Living Gallery, which is a DIY space in uh, Brooklyn um, for the past like 10 years at this point. Um, and so we wanted to highlight Cal both as an artist who makes really compelling uh, ambient pop music, um, but also as an organizer who really shepherds this space in, in an area that is becoming increasingly um, expensive to live in. Uh, and then also uh, more ease, who is a, uh, ambient and um, experimental pop musician as well uh, from Austin, Texas, who's been doing DIY touring and engaged in DIY scenes in, in Texas for, for a really long time, but whose practice is really grounded in collaboration. And you can just see if you go on her uh, Spotify, the, the number of uh, collaborators she has, which is part of this like generative community-based approach that we see is really central to DIY arts. And what is, what is your, personal, I, or I guess, what is Evil Dentist's sort of personal narrative involved with DIY spaces? How did you get started with that? Yeah, um, so like many people doing DIY, we just kind of stumbled into it uh, by a total accident. Um, so we, uh, I, I was living downtown um, in the East Village uh, during the pandemic um, because I'd gotten a COVID rate. And so I was actually able to live in this uh, neighborhood that's supposed to be 
a very artistic centered neighborhood. Uh, so in, in 2021, uh, in summer, as things were kind of opening up, um, we looked at the space that I had, which was a weird kind of lofty space, but not exactly because you couldn't stand up if you were in the elevated loft. And we were like, oh, that's a stage. Uh, and so um, we started throwing shows in my apartment. Um, and what we were really taken to was how, when you invite people into your home, especially in that liminal period as people were starting to leave their, their isolated bubbles, um, you know, they have a different experience of the performance. Uh, the space itself is transformed. So people experiencing art in my home was very different than if they went to a formalized venue. And so we saw the work that like we as artists could be engaged in, in terms of throwing shows as a kind of installation practice and as a performance practice where in bringing people together in unorthodox spaces, uh, we can really change the way in which people experience the art itself and the types of relationships that artists um, and audience members build between themselves and each other. Um, and so uh, we we started out with that kind of uh, DIY practice of just doing you know house shows, but we've grown from there um, to doing things outside. We often do uh, kind of generator type shows. Um, we'll do shows, of course, in these office spaces. Um, we've done shows uh, in dance studios when there's no dancers. Uh, we've, we've really just tried to think like, how could you take what is typically seen as a very commercial practice, that of booking artists to play a show and instead transform it into like an installation practice where you are gathering people together, you are transforming the space through various, um, in some cases like sculptural interventions like we had in our um, uh, both of our issue project room programs, um, but also just in like discursive interventions and in saying that we're, we're trying to create a space of community as opposed to a space of commerce. Um, and transform the, the the space and the experience. So that's kind of what what Evil Dentist has become. Um, so we think of ourselves as like a research and performance project. Um, and outside of that, we have a very committed practice of documenting um, dentist offices. Uh, so if you go on our Instagram page, we we collect photos of of dentist office. So if you'd like to submit, um, we're always looking for more dentist offices. We don't say that the dentists are evil. There may be an implication, but we're not saying that. So uh, that's 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 our collective project. And if I can say one more thing, um, I also have to highlight Alice Scarlock, my my collaborator, um, who I couldn't have done any of this without. Alice can't be here because they're on tour promoting their album Shoegaze Five G. So if you'd like to go and stream Shoegaze Five G, available on all platforms, um, Alice is a great cellist and experimental electronic artist. So go check out their work. Do we have a a clip of? some of the program. Thank you.
And that was in in NY at NYU. Yeah, it was a uh, a space that was for postdocs, uh, but most of the postdocs were not using it. Um, and so uh, we yeah had the performance there. You can see some of the installation aspects, um, such as the uh, we have all of these inspirational posters, which the artist uh, used during the performance put up. Uh, we also set up a water cooler uh, that was amplified, so you could hear the dripping of the water cooler uh, in a separate room, um, and. Uh, uh, a series of uh, a phone tree that you could call into one another um, was was established in the space. So we really wanted to play off of the 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 sense of the, the office, uh, but but really show that it doesn't have to be this uh, boring space. That it could it could be something more. I think is Will frozen for everyone else? Or okay. Um, maybe while we're waiting for William, I can just give a bit of context to the residency and fellowship programs. If that's okay, um, Eleanor, yeah. Um, so I Issue Project Room started our residency program uh, in 2006, uh, and we have multiple artists in residence each year. Um, the, the fellowship program is actually one of our newer programs. It's in its seventh year going to its eighth year now, and we only have one curatorial fellow each year. Um, but both programs are given budgets to work, support, stipend, marketing support, curatorial support, a lot of technical resources um, and additional um, additional as, you know operational um, and budgetary um, support. And so we sort of feel like it's it's really important to give artists as much flexibility as possible. Um, this obviously is critical when it comes to um, access of resources with partners. Um, but in particular, um, upcoming in the 20th anniversary, and just bringing it back to William's first earlier question to me, I think Suzanne would be actually really proud and happy that that our space, which we don't have full access to at this moment in time, is being given to Evil Dentist to actually utilize and, and present work for underrepresented practitioners. And so on November 4th, which is actually the 20th anniversary of issue project room evil dentist takes over 22 boring for the for the last event in the space and so we're really really um proud that we're able to give that opportunity to others i was going to ask silver if she would be uh kind enough to sort of walk us through the 2023 sort of some of the from the performances that have taken place at issue project room uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Silver, and I'm the communications manager here at Issue Project Room. Um, I'd be happy to. I will keep it short and sweet, but I'm happy to share my screen once again with you all and uh, direct you to our upcoming events page on our website, which I think is listed here in the chat. Just give me one moment. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. So this is my baby, this page. I take care of this <laughs> page for um, issues, upcoming events, as well as past events. So you can see here, um, really easy link access issueprojectroom.org slash events. You can access all upcoming events as well as our past events, which also now live in our media archive issue has a really amazing online media archive that we keep up to date with all of our performances. Um, so that's what we were just looking at to check out Evil Dentist as well as Bint's previous performance. But you can see our most upcoming event is the Roscoe Mitchell and John McCowan with Beam Splitter event this Saturday on the 9th at 8 p.m. And that's at First Unitarian Congregational Society. You can see Bint is right behind with stage two, the whitening coming up at CPR. You can get more information about that here as well. We've also got several events coming up at the Invisible Dog Art Center in the coming weeks. So those will be all with past curatorial fellows, including Ted Kerr, who's here with us today. Um, their event is here, Infection Melodies in Silence. 
Theodore Ted Kerr and Michael R. Jackson in conversation, which will be very exciting. And then we've got our series of 20th anniversary related events. So as you all know, this is our 20th anniversary uh, series coming up at the end of the month, as well as leading into October. We've got a slew of events coming up and they're all free for the most part. So they're all free with RSVP. Uh, we've got uh, projected redux from isolated field recordings, the Steve circuit, heroes are gang leaders, the list goes on and on. And this is all available on our upcoming events page here. And then as you scroll down, you can also see that we've got a couple of really special events coming up at, in the middle and at, at the end of October as well with Lori Spiegel and Seth Kluett. Um, they're doing a very special event with us called our, a harmonic algorithm 2020. Sarah Hennies is also joining us in a duo with Tristan Cast Kraus. And then we've also got Francisco Lopez, who is joining us at the end of October. There's some blindfolds involved. There's a dark, a dark 22, uh, 22 forum place involved. Very exciting. Uh, so those are all available now as well. Tickets are available. And then as Zeb had mentioned, we are using Evil Dentist's work to culminate our series at 22 Borum Place with yours in dentistry. Uh, very exciting. It's happening on the day of our anniversary. So that's November 4th. And as you continue to scroll down, you've got all of our past events here. So you can see events that have now taken place over the summer, uh, back in spring and in winter, we had $75 bill, rocket science, previous curatorial fellowship events, previous artist in residence events that include Kiki Hunt, who's another artist in residence this year, as well as Giancarlo Rodea, who are both not here with us today, but incredible artists in residence that are also um, continuing to show with us throughout the end of the year. And then of course, if you're interested, you can click and learn more and that'll also lead you to our media archive. So if you'd like to see more performances from earlier in the year, that archive is continuously being updated. It's living, it's breathing, and it's fully free and accessible to all of our audiences. Fantastic. Bint, I wanted to ask you about your training in the Hindustani vocal tradition and how it um and how it led to collecting stories of diaspora and how it informed your your current practice. I mean, there's the obvious music, but when did you start and and how did and how did that kind of transmogrify over the years um let's see into sunny vocals i kind of stumbled into it like back in like 2014 2015 um i was really curious about um pushing myself to use my voice it was one of the things that scared me the most um out of all my mediums and in my interdisciplinary practices over the years. And um, I actually started with a Western teacher. And after a few sessions, it just wasn't for me. It just a lot of the, it, it just, um, I don't know, it didn't really work with how I, how I learn. Um, and I, there's something about it that just didn't click. And then I was wondering about Indian music. I had, you know, grown up kind of listening to it on and off through my dad, who's from Pakistan. Um, uh and yeah i sought out a teacher off of like yelp or something when i was living in los angeles i'm originally from la and um i connected with the teacher right away and um it's just been an ongoing process um it informs my I, i've gone over the years I'll, I'll go i've gone in and out of studying um like i'll take months off um which had been has been very essential for me to Kind of apply what I've been learning traditionally to what I'm actually interested in, which is a lot of um, like uh, synthesis and uh, you know plugging it into cassette tapes or kind of like adding distortion to it and just like exp uh, exploring um, other layers of the sounds that uh, traditionally haven't really been supported <laughs> in my past. Um, and let's see. And through that, I discovered the harmonium. The harmonium is a really big part of my practice uh, musically, uh, both in sound art and in my music that's been recorded. And um, the harmonium is an accompaniment instrument to the voice as you're learning it. And um, 
and drones also are a very key part of my my practice and with Hindustani music you as a whole but especially with vocals you always have a drone a tampara playing um, to give you kind of a, a reference point it's uh, it's really essential so I've kind of run with the whole drone concept and kind of used it for anything and everything that I could um, that's a little bit and, of the background and have you been have you been working with other artists in that in that sort of musical realm do you do you collaborate with them um there are a couple that I've been collaborating with especially recently um and like over um pandemic I was able to uh, I don't know just a lot of the world was online and I uh, got connected with a few people in different places so that's a new area I haven't really been able to collaborate with a lot of people um in the past um a lot of the things I was doing with this traditional sounds were really unconventional and not really supported in my past. So I've kind of had to keep it um, a little bit to myself because it's hard to describe to people like why I'm making such ugly sounds with such beautiful things. Um, but that's been a big um, support that I've received actually with Issue Project Room since I've moved to New York where the experimental and avant-garde scenes as a whole, but especially with sound um, is just so thriving here and very open compared to what I had been used to, or I guess what I had back in LA personally. And um, yeah, it's, it's been really neat to discover and find others who are also interested in creating new soundscapes. So it's a new, it's a new development, but yes, I am collaborating with a few people. Great. And so everyone knows September 15th will be the second part of your Solvay Coagula um, project. Sev, I wanted to ask you, um, the Brooklyn Rail, very, I think we're very proud of the fact that we uh, wrote a piece about the 10th anniversary of Issue Project Room. And I think the 10th anniversary, art organizations are always happy to still to, to exist after 10 years. 20 years, I think the question becomes, what does the future hold and where are we going? And is there a need to redefine the path of issue project room or is it going to be a stay the course we're fine as we are what 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 are you thinking i think if you remain static you're uh you're not actually serving your community appropriately you need to consistently be challenging yourself and others around you um this has happened uh in some ways um naturally by the impact of the pandemic and then also through our fortune in now securing our permanent home. So those two fairly momentous um, items have really changed the way that we think about our future, um, in particular, how we serve artists and, and our audiences in the communities appropriately. Um, and it was referenced earlier about the challenges with fundraising. And I think that with all of all of those questions comes these really quite frustrating and boring questions around financial stability and investment and so forth. But I think that it's very, very important to ensure that you have a stable platform in which you can continue to launch. And ultimately, what we're looking to do is to have that stability and that structure in place so that artists like Evil Dentist and Bint um, and many others can essentially do whatever they want, knowing that they've got the structure and the framework in place that will support them. That includes budget, it includes staff, and it includes uh, audience who are open to that artistic conversation. And so we're constantly looking to cultivate community, engage with community and support community um, and that's not just people who buy tickets or turn up to events, but it's the partner organizations and the artists and their networks specifically. And I very much hope that in 10 years time, we'll be challenging ourselves and the artists and the communities that we work with to advance that conversation forward yet again. Hmm. I think something that happens with art organizations is that the initial spontaneity of, you know, the heady days of 2003 obviously has to progress into like institutional curatorial fellows are you are you able to sort of build in any sort of valve for spontaneity how does how does uh, uh, an organization like issue project room maintain this sort of certain you know 
moment, you know, of the moment quality. What do you what do you do to do that? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And I think you've hit in many ways on the answer, which is things like the curatorial fellowship. So often what happens is that as you're moving through your your life cycles and becoming a more mature organization, administratively, you become more safe and secure. And what we've wanted to do is constantly challenge ourselves by giving those questions and the decision-making processes to others with the support network and the budgets in place. So the way that you maintain that spontaneity, I think, is by turning to artists and curators like Bent and Evil Dentist to say, what do you want to do? How do you want to be better supported? And then you make the decisions as long as we're here ensuring that what you're wanting to do is appropriately supported, then you can ensure that um, you're maintaining that um, that spontaneity and the challenging um, the challenging nature of the work. And I have a sim similar question for David, uh, evil dentist. the The whole premise of artists inhabiting empty spaces, this kind of weird no man's land between urban decay, gentrification. I mean, it's it's very problematic, right? Because, you know, I remember there are a lot of places like Shea Stadium and Silent Barn. This idea of artists taking over an empty garage, maybe sometimes living there, doing performances, staking a claim where they are kind of hanging on to the, the kind of decay of the neighborhood or the idea that there are cheap rents and then the next step being that they are forced out and them kind of having both a, a part in, in both sides of the equation. I mean, how do you feel about this? This idea? It's it's not a, you know, it's very hard to build a, a idea of an institution or a, a regular presence of an artist or an artistic group in a place that is always in danger of being shut down or taken away. Right. I, I mean, I think this is the question. Um, so outside of my artistic and curatorial work, I'm a researcher, a PhD student at Columbia, and this is what I, I write on exactly. And I think part of the way in which this has been framed um, that's created maybe a bit of a dead end for thinking through some of the contradictions is um, we're thinking about like property, occupation of property, neighborhoods in a very static sense of like focusing on how rents change. And of course that is very important and how that impacts the community around. But in doing that, we kind of have this like separated enclave of this is where the artists occupy their space. Like this is Silent Barn. And then everything else around Bushwick Avenue is a distinct uh, place that that is affected by what goes on in the particular DIY venue, but fundamentally separate from it. And I think what our programs are trying to do and what where we need to be shifting our focus is not on the identity of people as artists, but on the relationships that artists build with one another and with the communities in which they occupy. And seeing that like a DIY venue is not necessarily going to be a instigator of gentrification, but if it's done in a particular way that you know circulates resources strictly among other artists and oftentimes other gentrifier artists, then it does become that. So the task and the challenge of the artist, I think, is not only to produce great work, but to produce great relationships. And part of that, I think, is about taking these models of mutual aid that we saw really getting more prominence during the pandemic and the ways in which there can be a different form of care that is circulated within a neighborhood and within a community and focusing exactly on that as part of the work of what a DIY venue or what an arts organization ought to be doing. Um, and I think that that can get us kind of to a different um, way of thinking about the relationship between arts and gentrification, because at the end of the day, it just is true, it seems, in the literature that artists serve, as, as one scholar puts it, as like the shock troopers of, of gentrification, right? That that they are, they are the ones who are the, on the front line. Um, but at the same rate, this is a relationship that we are being organized into because we don't have decision-making power over how neighborhoods unfold and how property relations develop, because that is largely in the hands of city bureaucrats and you know real estate holding companies or, or, or landlords. And so if there's a different type of work that's done by artists to create stronger relationships with communities, to engage in the work of like tenants organizing, to engage in like mutual aid, 
um, then I think there is a, a way of shifting the type of relationships that exist within and outside of a DIY venue or a, you know artist run space such that it can build a sense of community power. And I think you've seen this in, in some spaces that have emerged. Like for example, there was the space Club A, which was kind of like a anarchisty squat space, um, you know, in pre-pandemic. And after they lost their space, they shifted just to a full-on mutual aid project uh, at Bushwick City Farms, where they do food distro twice a week, um, in addition to other like community programs and events. And so I, I think I think you're seeing a sense uh, emerging within some corners of the DIY arts community that, yeah, we kind of can't follow this model of just having like raucous aughts, you know, Williamsburg warehouse parties, like that doesn't really get us anywhere. But if we instead take the relationships that we build with one another and try to expand them outward, then we can serve the communities that we're a part of. And then, you know, we can help people in those communities become artists and, and, and get the resources that they need, even though we only have limited resources, but artists can always offer inspiration. And so I, I think relationship building to offer that inspiration and then to determine what needs need to be served and build collective powers is really the philosophy of DIY mm -hmm. arts that, that can be used to fight gentrification. Yeah, and I think we we can make like a shout out to an institution like the, the, the Queens Museum that during the pandemic kind of opened their doors to both providing, I think, food, clothing to various, you know, food pantries, pantries and also doing like exercise classes for local seniors and things like that. So then the museum all of a sudden became a community focus without, without, you know, without sacrificing its curatorial exhibition schedule. It was, it was very interesting. So that, that was sort of a model that I thought seemed to, to begin to address that issue. Um, should I turn it over to Eleanor? Should we ask answer some questions? Yeah, thank you so much, Will. Um, and thank you so, so much to Silver and Zev and David and Bint. It's been such an inspiring and energizing conversation today and great sneak peeks at all amazing things that are to come um, at Issue Project Room. We've got a few audience questions today. Um, if you would like to send another question, anyone would like to ask a question, please send it in the chat or raise your hand and we will be happy to turn the mic to you. Um, the first question will be from our friend GE. Thank you so very much, Eleanor. And hi, William. And, um, and thank you, Zev, for all these years. Um, it seems, it seems, uh, when when I when I take it in shows their shows and because I think of them as something else, I, I guess what I'm thinking of is how did the issue project room really hit upon the ideas of ritual, taking considerations of things like holistic approaches to blend the analog and the creative tech with all kinds of spectrums of spiritualities. I mean, did that just gel in any particular way from the beginning, or because you know, or going forward to what? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and before I I try to answer it, I'll just say I, I agree. I don't like calling what we do shows either. Um, I, I sometimes reference them as gatherings. And um, anyway, but um, I, I don't think that there's a, a direct way to answer that question. I think it is very dependent on uh, the nature of the artists that you're working with and how you engage with them and how you're giving them the platform. So rather than us dictating a particular sensibility or a particular notion of, of that idea, what we like to do is try to bring artists together from divergent backgrounds or different disparate ideas and blending the conversation and often by pairing artists on programs or bringing people from different backgrounds and practices, different artistic disciplines, I think that it adds a really interesting artistic conversation. And um, I think that that is primarily driven at Issue Project Room by Suzanne's methodology and vision and us trying to live up to that by seeing the way that she would invite people in together as community, whether that is through engaging artistically or by simply cooking them dinner. And that idea of really trying to have a conversation that goes beyond just standing in front of somebody and presenting work. 
And I'm very proud that Issue Project Room, I think, has a longstanding history of continuing that tradition um, where you not only introduce artists to one another to work together. So as an example, um, Bent and John LaBarbera are in dialogue at the moment, which is really fascinating to see how two artists are collaborating, but also thinking about how programs speak to one another across a season, across a few weeks, um, and really the relationships that exist between the artists in residence together as a cohort, the artists in residence relative to the curatorial fellow, the curatorial fellows programs relative to what else issue project room is doing. And a lot of what David and Alice are doing challenge us and make us question how we are using space. And I think that that's very healthy. Um, and it keeps us on edge, I think in a really positive and constructive way. Um, I hope that has gone some of the way to beginning answering that question, but um, I think you never finished challenging yourself in that way to try to get that artistic dialogue moving forward. Thank you so very, very, very much. Thank you, GE. That was a great question. Um, and thanks, Sev. I have a question that I'd like to ask you all. Um, I'm curious, maybe especially to hear from the artists, but it would be great to hear from anyone. Um, how like artists working with Issue Project Room or collaborators at Issue Project Room interact with one another, thinking about the multiple generations of creative who are moving in and out of Issue Project Room, both on the artist end and also on like the staff end. Um, and how do how does Issue Project Room maintain those connections? And Zev, I've heard you use the word family in describing Issue Project Room, which is super lovely. So I'm just curious to hear more on how that dynamic is uh, kind of fostered within the organization. Uh, I'm, I was just waiting to see if David or, or Bint want to start off, but I, I can kick us off that um, I would first state that during the pandemic, that was a very important question that we were concerned about. We lost the ability to physically interact in the way that we traditionally had by inviting people together in a room. Um, and I think we're still coming out of that process and trying to ensure that we've got the right systems and structures in place. Um, sometimes it's as simple as saying all artists and residents and curatorial fellows should be getting free tickets to absolutely everything. And we want you to be in the room because there's a way that you can each other. But it's also just opening up the network of our advisory council and other artists that we've worked with um, and making introductions like what I was just referencing with Joan LaBarbera for, for Bint. But ultimately, I think the best way to facilitate this is by asking the curatorial fellow and the artist in residence to engage in program decisions going forward by asking them who we should be working with, who they want to introduce us to, and how we continue to enable um, the, 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 the broadening of that artistic conversation. So I, I actually think David, who's just gone through some of these processes with us, might be the best person to speak to some of that. Sure, yeah. Um, I think what first comes to mind for me is just conversations I've had with uh, Seth Cluett, who is a professor of mine at Columbia, but also a frequent issue collaborator and artist, uh, has a performance coming up. And what I got so much from conversations with Seth was maintaining the spirit of Issue Project Room. And uh, in in particular, he, he just boiled it down to, you have to think about what is, what the three words are in 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 the in the name right what is the issue what's the project you're going to use to address the issue and then we'll find the room for you uh and and that sense of like really breaking down what the what the what the what the practice is in, into those components has been, has been really helpful um and then i think uh you know I, i'd be remiss not to highlight you know the guidance that, that zev has shown alice and i um and and zev is is very much someone who will point us in uh, really compelling directions. We'll, we've had conversations with Zev when we've, Dallas and I have been on tour and we're like, Zev, we're driving through, uh, you know, a, a Native American reservation or reception might be dipping and Zev's still like giving us feedback. Or one of my favorite brief Zev stories was when we got on the phone with him 
And he was like, oh, I was up all night. My neighbors were being so annoying. I've lost my voice. Uh, I, I'm hoarse because I was yelling at them. And he's like, I won't say much. Just just tell me what you're interested in doing for the next program. And, and I'm sure it'll be fine. And so we, we share it with Zev. And, and Zev's hoarse voice, he's like, I have a couple of thoughts. And then 20 minutes of, of criticism and comments and, uh, you know, pushing his voice to the limit. And, and, and it is stuff like that, that, that in, in the moment we're like, oh God, I guess we went the wrong direction. But Hear, hearing that is really what what has pushed us to grow as, as artists and as curators and and so so yeah I, I'd like to highlight yeah Zev and Seth in particular for 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 helping us. I'll, I'll take all of that as a compliment. Um, <laughs> it's a compliment, yeah. But I think I think that um, it is worth noting that all the members of Issue Project Room staff act in that capacity. Um, we're all engaged with the curatorial fellows, the artists in residence, the artists that we're working with week to week in a constant dialogue um, about whether it's curation or specific operational or communication questions. And particularly in today's world, what is being put out there into, into the community um, on the websites and on social media platforms is really important. And I think it is worth just bringing it back to the archive. Everybody should feel free to go to the archive, look at look at what um, has taken place, but also referencing what Silva was mentioning is that it's a living, breathing series of um, of uh, recordings that other artists are referencing and that people are coming back to and engaging with. And the archive exists in service of the artists. We don't create this so that we can put it out there for our own benefit. We're trying to ensure that artists have access to high quality recordings, audio and video that are edited so that they can use it to promote themselves, their own work and, and conversations amongst each other. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, that was an amazing segue, perfect segue into our final question from Chloe. Um, so over to you, Chloe. Well, first, I just want to thank you all for this incredibly enlightening and generous dialogue today. I've enjoyed every second of it. Um, and thank you so much. And many congratulations on 20 years, which is such a great milestone. Um, my question was about archives. I was curious how the organization's relationship to your archive has changed over those two decades and sort of how the archive has become part of being a social organization and part of thinking about longevity and uh, time in relationship to your work with artists then and now. It, it's a fantastic question that I just started actually by chance answering, but um, I think it's a very, very important um, consideration. And I think that while Issue Project Room's archive going back 20 years is a little bit spotty, um, what I can really talk to, I think, is the decisions that we made seven, eight years ago that inform what our methodology is now and into the future, which is um, even under financial duress, we made a decision to invest very heavily in processes like archives and archival management. The main reason we did that was first and foremost in service of art. So when we were talking with artists around that time, many, many people in our community were saying, I don't have good quality recordings of my own work, which is stopping me promoting myself, getting more performances, commissions, tours. So while I would love to say that we foresaw the ability to use small video clips on Instagram to promote ourselves, um, that was really quite a lot of luck in that we chose to invest very heavily in service of the artist. And only with the artist's permission would then the, um, the archival material be allowed to be placed into the public realm. We would media we would do media editing for we would pay for it and give it to the artists for free. We would do the highest quality video and audio recordings that we could, again, all in service of the artist. Um, and then because of this shift in uh, the new medium in which people can can um, interact with work, particularly through 
web-based platforms and social media, we got quite fortunate that we were already set up to do that. And then again, when the pandemic hit, we were in a place in which uh, having an, a depth of understanding and um, technology systems in place allowed us to pivot very quickly to digital commissions, not trying to replicate what the work would have been in the room. And so just bringing it back to our anniversary now, this is why what we're doing to reopen the Borum space with the projected Redux work where people can come and actually interact in a much different setting rather than looking on their computers to see these digital commissions that were created during the pandemic and now see them projected with a proper sound system and be together in a physical environment together. So it comes back to that, that idea to try to come back to your question as well of what is an archive to us. It's something that's living and breathing just because something was commissioned during the pandemic and was put on the website doesn't mean it doesn't have a function in an artistic conversation today. And so I'd love to encourage people to come to Borum, join us for a drink. As Silva mentioned, all these events are free with um, the projected Redux. And we have a number of artists having panel conversations around the work that they created and their practices today. So again, trying to hand it back to the artists to contextualize what they did during the pandemic. And we just love to see everybody physically come back together and enjoy this work in a different setting um, and experience the archive in a very different way. Thank you so much. That was such a generous answer and an exciting one to hear. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that question, Chloe. Um, thank you, Zev. Um, again, this has been such a lovely conversation um, and, and I'm just so grateful to have had you all here today. Um, we do have a tradition here at the rail of concluding our community events with a reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome Theodore Ted Kerr, who was Issue Project Room's 2022 Suzanne Fuel Curatorial Fellow to the stage. Uh, Theodore Ted Kerr is a writer and organizer. He's a founding member of What Would an HIV Doula Do? and co-author of the book, We Are Having This Conversation Now, The Times of AIDS Cultural Production. Ted, thank you so much for being here today and over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ted. I tried to turn my camera on and I'm not able to. Um, I'm sorry about that. So feel free to close your eyes and picture a white 44 year old bald man with an impressive mustache. And um, let me just say that uh, on September 27th at the Invisible Dog, I'll be in conversation with uh, Michael R. Jackson. Uh, he's a Tony Award winning playwright. And one of the many things that I love about his work is the way he brings voice uh, to the unsaid and it should be said to the unsung. And I guess specifically what I really like about his work is um, this moment in a strange loop where he really focuses on uh, what it was to be a kid growing up in a religious home where AIDS is used as a punishment for uh, being gay. It's a very heartbreaking thing. And I appreciate this because my own work as a writer, educator, and artist really meets at the corner of HIV and silence. Um, I wrote a book uh, with Alexandra Uaz, and uh, if, you, if my camera was working, you would see it. Uh, it's called We're Having This Conversation Now, The Times of AIDS Cultural Production. And um, uh, yeah, um, and among the many things uh, that we talk about in the book is silence and the role that silence has played throughout the ongoing HIV AIDS epidemic. And we say that silence is not an absence of sound, but the lack of connection between isolated utterances. So silence is not a lack of sound. It is uh, the lack of connection between isolated utterances. And among the many things that fester in isolation is misinformation. And so um, what I'm gonna do is read a poem in process um, about you know, an idea that comes up a lot, this idea that a generation was lost to AIDS. And what I'd like to say is what gets silenced when this generalization circulates. So the poem is called, I think it's hard to live when people tell you you're dead. And it's dedicated to people diagnosed yesterday and diagnosed tomorrow. Some people my age and younger 
have confused the silence that came after the 1996 introduction of life-saving medication as a kind of proof that AIDS killed an entire generation of gay men. While we can never underestimate the amount of premature and needless death that came as a result of the cruel and intentional mismanagement of the early crisis by the US government, stating that an entire generation of gay men was lost is its own kind of cruelty, erasure, and loss. It's an understandable hyperbole, one that does not hold space for long-term survivors, long-term witnesses, those who for whatever reason were alive but missed the crisis, and non-gay men impacted who survive. Black women, nurses, your friend's uncle who got trapped in the system, reproductive health activists, to name just a few. These people are around and have been around, living in our shared silence, wanting to talk, listen, look back and move forward together. We can understand this shared silence as having been, currently being, equal parts the younger generation's inability or fear to start the conversation, the older generation's trauma and fear to start the conversation, and our shared desire to respect the supposed boundaries we thought were in place. Even when I was at the HIV organization in the early 2000s, making safer sex kisses with Ken, a man who had facial wasting due to his early AIDS meds, I felt like it was not my place to talk about the one thing, the very thing, the thing that brought us there. And it seems the self-silencing was true too for him. Our fingers slick with lube, our throats dry with stop, our tongues tied together. But there he was, as sure as I was, not dead. Our silence, a proof of his survival. What is the difference between stigma and trauma when it stops us from connecting? Thank you very much. Thank you so, so, so much, Ted. That was beautiful um, and super, super inspiring. I feel really lucky to have been able to hear your work today and really lucky again to have heard from all the amazing folks at Issue Project Room. Um, thank you to Ted again. Thank you to Zev, David, Bint, shout out Evil Dentist and William, and thank you so much, Silver, as well, for helping with screen share and for your words and all your support behind the scenes. We would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible, for supporting our archive, which is on our YouTube channel, and also living, breathing organism that grows every day from our NSC, so please be sure to check it out. For the past 22 years, The Rail has been a platform for arts, culture, and politics in our free monthly publication and public events like our NSC. So please check the chat for a link to donate to support our work here at The Rail. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time if you're free for a conversation with Rachel Feinstein and Andrew Woolbright on Feinstein's three concurrent shows in Florence. And we'll conclude tomorrow with a reading by Rachel James. Um, thank you everyone for so much for tuning in and you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave hope you all stay cool enjoy the rest of your day thank you for tuning in great to see you all thank you thank you so thank much you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank, thank you so david thank, thank you, you thank birthday to issue thank you so much <laughs> hey. thank you